Well, people seem to enjoy my uh, some of my videos on uh, barcode uh, barcode products that I designed in the way back days. Um, this was probably my crowning <laughs> crowning achievement when I would call myself an electrical engineer. Um, I called myself an electrical engineer from about 1980 to 1980, maybe maybe 1990. So I'd say for for 10 years I was mostly an electrical engineer, and then I started doing optics, and I did mostly optics for the rest of my career. But um, this was probably my, like I said, my crowning achievement as an electrical engineer. Um, this is a uh, microwave power meter uh, by the WaveTech company. Um, so uh, I actually worked at WaveTech as the, uh, a principal engineer and then uh, got promoted to be the R&D manager. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the, one of the products that I, uh, that I, that I designed. Uh, I was actually responsible for like every bit of this instrument from the front panel to the power connector. Um, and um, it is a, uh, let's see here, if I can flip it up, maybe you can see it a little bit better. Put the legs up. Um, it is a two channel power meter. Um, and you can use various sensors. Uh, we had a whole, the whole, whole product line of sensors, um, anywhere from, uh, you know, one megahertz to 40 gigahertz, and um, they had different power levels from uh, very low power levels to um, very high power levels with built-in attenuators and things like that. Um, uh, Hewlett Packard uh, and Booten uh, were two companies that also had power meters. Um, this was built as a competitor to the Hewlett Packard products. And at the time, the Hewlett Packard had um, some power meters which were very good, um, but they were also very slow. Um, in order to make very small power measurements, you need very long settling times uh, in the uh, in the circuitry, so there was often chopper amplifiers and uh, very long delay uh, filters to settle out measurements, and uh, they were just slow. Um, and so the idea of this meter was to be able to operate uh, either in a very slow mode, like all the old ones, or operate in very fast modes. So when you had high power levels, when you didn't really worry about signal to noise ratios, um, or you wanted just very quick measurements and you weren't too uh, worried about accuracy, uh, this would allow you to actually operate the the, uh, the power sensors very, very quickly as well. So it could do both. Um, it was actually quite successful as a product. Um, and later, uh, Hewlett Packard had to respond to it and they came out with uh, with a product to, to compete with this one. Um, so, let's see, let me... Read, I think this is hard to read. This is a model 8542. The 42 was the two channel input. The 41 was a one channel input. Um, and then there were options to put these connectors on the rear panel. Um, so some of these you'll see they don't have any connectors on the front. All the connectors are, are in the rear. Uh, it has a two line LCD display uh, with uh, push buttons on the front, a menu system with arrow keys. Um, so this is a, this is a prototype. Uh, this was uh, not never sold. This was uh, one of the uh, R&D units that we used for uh, uh, the design, uh, characterization, um, and the performance. Uh, uh, it may have actually gone through heat cycling as well. I don't remember about this particular unit. Um, <laughs> one of the very, very first units I built, uh, we needed to send it through heat cycling. And we had these big ovens, these big industrial ovens that we could put the instrument in, and we can run them in a test mode while we heat them up. And we, then we would run them for days on end. Um, and uh, the first night, we set it all up, and we, we had it running. We said, okay, we'll let it run overnight. We'll come back in the morning. And our oven uh, thermostat broke, and the oven went to maximum heat. <laughs> and completely melted down the instrument. It was hilarious. The ICs actually fell out of the PC board. The, all of the solder melted, and the, and the ICs just fell out of the PC boards when they were upside down. Um, it was just burnt to a crisp. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's open this up and take a look inside. So we had a very good uh, mechanical engineer working for us at the time, 
and uh, he designed this uh, case and it's just two screws uh, two uh, look like number six or number eight screws on the back you just remove those two screws and the whole thing comes apart uh, which was a really nice design so here we go um, so the way that works is uh, there's tension uh, in this direction and then there's this internal frame uh, so uh, this internal frame is actually a really cleverly built uh, piece of metal that's bent and uh, it allows two things one is it allows a, a pull in this direction to, to hold everything together it also uh, has a, a piece of metal running right down the center it's all one piece and it allows you to put one board on one side and one board on the other side. So the digital board uh, ends up on this side and the analog board ends up on this side and now there's this big piece of metal that sits between the two as a electrical shield. So uh, it actually ended up really, really nice. Um, so uh, let's take a look at the digital section first. That's probably okay. Um, so this is a 68,000 processor. Uh, so it's a 68,000 uh, controller. Um, uh, lots of ROM and RAM. Um, it had a very sophisticated operating system uh, that was a real-time operating system. And so uh, it allowed uh, multi... Um, uh, uh, multi... Um, subroutines to be work, all running in parallel and uh, working in a kind of a uh, 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 a circle so that each each you could you could assign a, a certain percentage priority to each each uh, each each function and it would go round and round and round and then it would also support interrupts so if you got uh, uh, control signals or other things happening like uh, pressing the foot front panel button or getting a uh, uh, getting an IEEE 488 signal from the back, it would it would interrupt, and it was, it was a very nice real-time operating system that that we were running. Um, so uh, this particular program uh, uh, ate up uh, six uh, six slots here, looks like, uh, and uh, these are low-density parts. So you can see the. It's actually designed to take 32-pin uh, parts or 28-pin parts, and so these are all 28-pin parts. Uh, the RAM that we have installed right now is 32-pin uh, uh, parts, and so they're Toshiba uh, 55100s, or 1001s, uh, sorry. Um, I believe it could support four RAM chips and six ROM chips. Um, like I said, this is the uh, 68000. Uh, here's a connector to the front panel. Uh, so there's some chips here. This is a keyboard controller, a 8279. 82, uh, 82 uh, there are a bunch of 8255s in here. Um, uh, this is a 55. This is a 55. Um, let's see. don't remember what this chip is. I know there's a real-time clock in here somewhere. Uh, uh, it's got a 24 megahertz crystal, so I think this operated at the 12 megahertz. Uh, the 68,000 was operating at 12 megahertz. Um, there's a section in the back here. Uh, there's some double sticky. There was some uh, uh, the the RAM I think is battery backed up uh, with a with a battery that got Velcroed on here. There's a Dallas uh, 1210 uh, controller. Uh, voltage controller chip to back up the RAM so you could store calibration data and it would remember it um, that got stuck on here underneath this this here is a uh, I think it's a 9914 uh, IEEE 488 controller and the driver chip so this is all this this ribbon cable right here is the uh, IEEE um, there's a analog power supply uh, there's a, a transformer down here and uh, all linear regulators up here um, and again it's all made so that the heat sinks go right onto this also this unit una uniframe uh, so again a very clever design uh, we used we use this big piece of metal as the heat sink for the power supply um, yeah pretty good 
So let's take a look at the analog section. Uh, the analog section is much more complicated. Um, uh, one of the key things in this system is the star ground. Uh, um, this thing actually will measure down to minus or uh, minus 70 dBm, so 70 picowatts. 70 picowatts of power this thing can still be measuring. So it had a very, very low low noise floor, a very, very fancy front end uh, section to be able to accomplish that. And uh, it had to rely on a really good star ground. So there's multiple grounds in this uh, device. And they all connect back here to this uh, connector. This, this connector right here goes between the two boards. And there's a, a point on that connector that's the star ground and allows you to uh, separate the noise signals and everything. Um, so this is the master A to D. Uh, I think it's a 14-bit A to D, if I remember right. Um, so it, it handles all of the measurements. Uh, this is, I think, a 16-channel multiplexer, so you can measure 16 different items uh, on this uh, A to D. Uh, there's also some D to A's. Uh, this is a D to A, this is a D to A, D to A. Um, these are 8255s, so the, the data the data lines come up and get buffered, uh, and digital signals get sent out onto the board. Um, unfortunately, the uh, can here is soldered down. This is where the analog circuitry is. Uh, there's two channels. Uh, you can see the two connectors here, channel A, channel B, and uh, uh, they go into this uh, uh, area here. So again, you know, 70 picowatts isn't a lot of uh, power, very, very low voltages you're trying to measure. Um, and so it all needs to be shielded very well and chopper stabilized and things like that. So we'll look at the schematic for all of that. Um, this section here we can open up. Uh, I didn't design this. I designed everything else. Uh, this was uh, a, a piece of the uh, system that had already been used on another instrument that we had before I got there. This is a calibrator, a 50 megahertz calibrator for the power source to be able to calibrate the sensors. And so I just, I just took the design they had and, and uh, copied it onto this one. So, so we can open that up and look inside. So all of this circuitry up here has to do with driving the, uh, the actual calibration part. Um, and this connector here uh, is the 50 megahertz reference calibrator. Uh, the 50 megahertz reference calibrator comes out to a uh, comes out to a, a connector here on the front panel. All right. Uh, I don't think much much else to see here. There's a volt voltage reference here. One of these really uh, fancy 3999 uh, an LM399 uh, voltage reference and a little little oven. Um, a lot of mica capacitors. Um, yeah, uh, you can see a bunch of bod wires on this one. This that, you know, definitely was a prototype. Uh, let's open this up. Take a look inside. Okay, uh, so here we have the the 50 hertz reference oscillator. So it's in it's in three parts. Um, first of all, there's an oscillator, which is this section here, so 50 megahertz oscillator, just a regular Colpitz oscillator. Um, then there's this section here, which is actually a stepped attenuator. It's a pin diode uh, switched stepped attenuator. I forget how many dBs of, of switching it allows. Um, but if I remember right, the oscillator itself has a, a, a 10 dB range, and then uh, in order to calibrate, you might calibrate at uh, at uh, zero dBm, minus ten dBm, minus twenty dBm, minus thirty dBm. And every time you calibrate each decade, you're you're switching this uh, pin diode uh, attenuator. Um, so that's what that does. Um, and then you need to be able to make sure that this is a very very linear uh, uh, zero zero to ten. Uh, dB oscillator that the power output of this is very very accurate so there's actually a power meter inside the power meter and that's what this is over here um, it uh, has a lot of filtering so it's a very quiet circuit and there's actually a thermistor uh, 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 power sensor here um, 
on it looks like it's on a Teflon board it's a real fancy little part I forget what the part number is um, but that's the power meter inside the power meter the power meter uh, calibrates the reference and then the reference calibrates the rest of the instrument so that's that's how you get the absolute accuracy of this thing um, it was mistraceable all right let's button this back up and uh, let's look at a couple schematics all right, so this was built by Wavetech. Uh, Wavetech uh, was uh, purchased by a uh, single company, actually one guy, a real rich guy, and uh, he operated it as a um, uh, uh, privately owned company for several years, and then ending, ended up selling, uh, pie piecing out um, Wavetech and. He sold this microwave division to Gigatronics, and uh, so um, Gigatronics continued to build uh, the uh, power meter uh, after Wavetech did, uh, the 8540 series. So this is a manual from the Gigatronics days. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what can we find out about this thing? Um, so I had a, uh, a group that did all the manuals, so I... Uh, was responsible for all this stuff back in the day. Uh, so here's a block diagram of the CPU. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, there's a 68,000 12 megahertz clock, interrupts, uh, keyboard controller, front panel LEDs, front panel LCD, that's on the bus. And then there's uh, banks of ROM and RAM, the GPIB out to the IEEE 4088, battery backup for bank one of the RAM, uh, buffers out to the analog board and a power supply. So pretty straightforward. Um, let's see what else can we find out. Um, so uh, here's the black diagram for the analog section. So this channel A, channel B, uh, they get chopped. Um, and I'll talk about that chopping. It's a very fancy vert chopping. Um, there's an amplifier selectable from gains of 1, 64, 512, or 4096. Uh, there's an offset DAC so you can put these in within range. And then it gets followed by another amplifier from 1, 8, and 64. So you can see this thing has lots and lots of gain. You know, 4000 times 64. There can be a lot of gain in the system for those very, very low signals. Those very low signals are going to have terrible signal-to-noise ratios, so you need a, a very, very good uh, filter in these things. So stage one is an actual uh, uh, hardware filter. So this is a 10 kilohertz low-pass filter, um, and then that goes to the ADD. In the software, there's also very fancy digital uh, uh, low-pass filter. So, uh, again, like I said, this thing could operate either fast or slow. You can operate it fast directly out of the hardware, or in software you could do uh, time averaging uh, filtering uh, in order to, to do very, very good signal to noise extraction and have very, very low minus 70 dBm. Um, okay. Schematics. Uh, let's see. Uh, these might be really hard to see on camera, but uh, 68,000 processor, buses, uh, I think everything we saw on the, on the circuit board explains it. Here's our, here's our 24 megahertz oscillator, it goes into a wide by 2, so it's 12 megahertz coming out. Uh, it is selectable here for, from one, 1, 2, 4, or 8 weight states. Um, and then there's some additional clocks that go out at 8 megahertz, 4 megahertz, 2, and 1 megahertz going out uh, for various things that might need it. Uh, here's a timer chip, an 8254. Uh, I believe that timer chip is used to create a heartbeat, a tick, uh, a interrupt tick for the real-time operating system so that uh, you can come back around. Um, let's see, here's... Here's all the uh, ROM and RAM. Uh, here's the power supply. Very boring. Uh, just a uh, transformer. Uh, had to be able to operate in all countries. So uh, 
the most difficult one is Japan, which is a uh, hundred hertz, uh, fifty. I mean, fifty fifty hertz, a hundred volts, and then it had to go up to one hundred twenty volts, sixty hertz. So kind of a wide range. Um, and then it outputted uh, five uh, plus ten plus five plus fifteen minus fifteen. So pretty standard stuff. Um, uh, this is one of the analog channels. This is channel A. Um, you can see that uh, uh, there's a front end. So this part of the front end does the chopping. And instead of just chopping open, open, closed, open, closed, open, closed, it actually chops. Uh, there's a plus and minus sense that comes out and it's measuring the, the voltage difference between those plus and minus signals. And what it does is it actually measures the voltage this way, and then it turns them over and measures the voltage this way. So if there's any DC offset in there, you're measuring it by flipping it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And um, at these very, very low voltages, uh, just two different dissimilar metals will cause a huge voltage. So um, if you look at the old HP power meters, they're all gold on gold. Everything is gold on gold. Um, whereas this could tolerate a little bit of voltage differences because you're chopping back and forth in a differential version. It also chops to ground, um, so it's keeping track of any DC offsets, so it does that as well. So it, it's a very clever chopping circuit. It then goes into a uh, differential amplifier. This is an AD625, very high performance uh, uh, differential amplifier. And this is the gain settings. Uh, of analog switch with all the gain settings for this thing up to 4,000. Uh, and then there's another gain uh, stage here, an LT1014, uh, and then a uh, uh, six-pole Bessel filter uh, <coughs> goes on to the output. Okay. Uh, channel B is the same as channel A. Uh, uh, this is the A to D section. Uh, there's a, a multiplexer that brings in a whole bunch of signals that you can measure, and then the A to D. And then these are all the D to A's that allow you to do DC offsets and other things. Um, this is uh, another D to A uh, with some outputs. I believe what this does is this allows you to output voltages uh, that you can use. Um, in various circuits, so. Um, this is the uh, calibrator, the 50, 50 megahertz calibrator. So this is the oscillator. Uh, this is the pin diode uh, attenuator. And this is the power meter inside the power meter. Uh, there's a, a uh, an oven. It's held at uh, 60 degrees C, and there's a thermistor. That thermistor allows you to measure the uh, power. Um, so that's what that does. Oh, part number of that thing is a. Uh, hmm, the power meter uh, part number for that thing? That might be custom. It says one. It says A one R T one, but I. This may be a custom part that we had built. I can't remember. Uh, power supply distribution. Uh, front panel. Pretty boring. All right. Let's uh. Let's see if this thing powers up. Uh, I, I it ran it one time, maybe ten years ago, but I've I haven't uh, powered it up in about ten years. So let's try. All right, I plugged in the power cord here, and we'll try to power this thing up. We sold a lot of these to the Navy, um, and we sold a lot of them to Motorola. Uh, but uh, turn it on. Here we go, Gigatronics. Uh, must have had Gigatronics software in it. No sensor attached. Okay, so it's no sensor, but we can go into the menu. Uh, let's see here. Offset. Resolution, average, user cal factor, peaking meter, reference power on off, uh, A, B, A divided by B, more, setup menu, service menu. 
Wow, I'd forgotten all about all these things. Uh, let's see here. Uh, once you've uh, fi figured out which one you want here, let's put hit resolution. I think you hit enter. No. Menu again? No. Uh, let's see. Menu, no sensor attached, resolution. Oh, maybe you hit le right arrow, left arrow? No. Uh, how does this thing work? I don't remember. Uh, hmm. Well, maybe the buttons aren't working. I think the buttons are working. Oh, maybe, maybe it's not going to do anything because there's no sensor attached. Uh, let me find it. Let me find my sensor. You think I remember how to operate this thing? But uh, anyway, here's a here's a sensor. This is a uh, one megahertz to twenty gigahertz sensor. Uh, this one goes up to twenty three dBm, uh, or not not to exceed. So let's uh, let's plug this on here to. So sensor A is uncalibrated, so it knows. And uh, let me cut the cable tie here. All right. So in order to calibrate a sensor, you plug it onto the, screw it onto the calibrator. And hit the cal button. Uh, zero cal. Checking sensor, please wait. Zeroing A. Calibrating A. So this is where it's doing the 50 megahertz um, and stepping through each decade range. It's going to calibrate the entire working range of the sensor. And there we go. So it's uh, measuring nothing right now. Minus 100 dBm. Uh, we'll just leave it hooked up here. So now, if we go into the um, into the uh, menu and go up here, maybe to offset. Yeah, there we go. Now we can offset. Oh, so we can add an offset if we want it to measure actually uh, 1 dB of offset. We can just say that. So now it's measuring minus 99 instead of uh, minus 100 and it's giving us a, a light here saying that we have a, an offset applied uh, so we can uh, get rid of that offset uh, so we can go into resolution we can have it displaying what the top and the bottom one resolution looks like it's kind of cute um, averaging uh, we have an auto averaging or uh, we can put in manual like an average of eight. Uh, otherwise, it, it knows the power level you're at and knows how much averaging to do in order to get a good number. Um, user cal factor. I think if you want to override the cal factors that are in the sensor, you can do that. Peaking meter. Um, we had sensors that had peak detection on them, but I don't. Reference power on or off. So we can turn the reference power on. So we can do that right here on, and there we go. We're, we're getting uh, minus uh, 0.02 dBm. So the the uh, calibrator right now is outputting uh, zero dBm, and there we go. It's measuring 0. 0.00. So it's it's uh, it's very very accurate. This thing is amazingly accurate. Um, okay, so we can turn off our reference power off. Okay, that's good. And let's see here. We can do math between the two sensors, ratios and things like that. Um, setup menu, service menu is interesting. Sensor ROM, reading it. So it, it, it there's a E squared prom in the sensor and so it's measuring at the model number. Um, that's kind of clever. Service menu, uh, calibrator, 
test functions. It will go into a test. I actually wrote all the software for the test section of this thing. Um, and so turn LEDs on, make a selection. So all the LEDs are on. Oh, turn LEDs off. Okay. LEDs on, LEDs off. And game. <laughs> so, <laughs> a very few of these sold had the game built in. And there's a big story for me on the game. So, um, I had never written a program in uh, C before. Uh, I was fluent in uh, BASIC, Fortran, and Forth, um, and uh, 8080 Assembler, but I'd never written a program in C before. So I needed to teach myself C. And so I needed something to push me into learning the C language, and so I wrote a game. <laughs> and so this is the game. Use, uh, get one LED. Okay, so it's... Uh, these things are coming back, so you have to jump across the street. It's kind of like Frogger, I guess? I don't know, or one of those games. And then you try to get to the other end, and then you get a, a, an LED every time you make it to the other end. And uh, so that was my... Uh, and then if it hits you, it pushes you back. And I think if, it, if you get hit too many times, then you, then you lose, or something like that. Um, I don't remember how you lose. Anyway, so I wrote this little game just to teach myself C, and uh, it was actually part of the service menu for some, for some part. It was kind of an Easter egg. Um, unfortunately, we had to remove it uh, because the U.S. Navy found that uh, sailors were, <laughs> were playing the game <laughs> on board ship, and uh, they said, you've got to get rid of that thing, and so we were forced to remove the game on some, uh, at partic some particular date, so the sailors... <laughs> Sailors couldn't uh, couldn't play uh, my game any longer. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see here. So game sensor B, DVM. Yeah, you could actually turn sensor A into a DVM. So it's actually telling you how many millivolts the sensor is actually measuring and what range it's on, range six. So these are all calibration th or uh, service things for uh, troubleshooting. Um, there's a, a B and C in the back that you could actually use as a DVM for testing. Uh, there are hardware tests. Uh, T1 output DAC. Uh, T1 output DAC. Yeah, I don't remember how this all works, but... Uh, in terms of the machine, I brought a lot of test voltages over to the A to D so I could troubleshoot what was wrong with it. So there's a bunch of built-in things into the, into the test menu. Uh, this is a loopback test, offset test, all kinds of tests here. Uh, gain tests, uh, lots of crazy things. Anyway, turn that off. I uh, thought you'd enjoy that. Uh, from the way back days, 68,000 processor, uh, half of its RAM, I mean, half of its digital, half of its analog. It's all through hole. Uh, this dates from the uh, mid 80s. Um, and uh, uh, believe it or not, I believe a version of this instrument is still being sold today. Well, it's, been, it's been a good success.